play and showed up in the boards. I mean, who knows? Uh, they would have maybe paid more attention. Then my buddy, got his, his truck got outlawed by car. He had a logging truck. And he, uh, he lost his means. Well, he first he did fight that too. He fought it with the DMV and he went to a bunch of meetings and everything, but soon he lost, he lost his means to make a living. So he's leaving. His house just sold, he's moving to Idaho. More and more folks are going to go unless we can give her some hope. Let's get everyone together and join together into this call to action thing and fight. Don't forget to sign up at that back table. I'd like to thank everyone for coming, and I'm going to uh, dive out of here so you guys can hear some real speakers. Mark Baird drove four hours through the snow to get here. And it was a drive that should have took him two, and, and he's still brave the, the weather to make it, so we're really happy to have him. So we want to welcome Mark Baird. Thank you all for coming here today, taking your Sunday and bad weather and coronavirus and everything else to come out and listen. And he's right. He's right about a lot of things. He's right about the call to action. Um, I was not sure what I was going to say here today. In fact, I, I've been stewing over this for a week, and I really didn't know what I was going to say until probably this morning, late morning at that, late for us anyway. We got up before the sun to crack the ice out of the water tank so that the animals could drink and fed everybody and plowed the driveway, plowed the roads a couple of times and then got ready, came down here, a couple of road closures. But this was important to me to come. And the reason it was important is because it's important for you to come. And, and I didn't want, I had a commitment to honor and I was gonna honor that commitment uh, come hell or high water. I apologize for my glasses I'm trying to look over, but I have to look at my notes that I can't read most of the time. Um, I want to tell you a couple of things. This might make a few people angry, and quite frankly, I don't care, because these things are true. I want to tell you the truth today, and nothing but the truth. And I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to, I want you to check me on this stuff. I want you to look it up on the internet, or look it up in books, or look it up in your Bible, or wherever you have to go. Because this has to be the truth for it to reach your heart. And that's the message I kind of got last night and this morning. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of truth. First of all, this is a Christian nation. That is the truth. I can prove that in a thousand documents, a thousand letters, a thousand speeches, and a thousand things. It is not a deist nation. The, the, there's a favorite story going around that some of our founding fathers were deists. In other words, a deist is a guy who believes that God is the big watchmaker and he built this, this cool watch and he wound it and then he just threw it down and he stepped back to see how the watch worked over the next 10,000 millennia. That's not true. These, our founders were Christians and their faith was in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and, and Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. That's the principles upon which this nation was founded. Now, I know that we're going to talk about separation of church and state. And I want to remind you that the separation of church and state is nowhere in the Constitution. The Constitution does not mention separation of church and state anywhere. Not one single time, nowhere in it. And I've probably read this thing about 5,000 times. This is the owner's manual to this nation. That's it. Not very long, not very thick, pretty easy to read. Um, not very exciting sometimes, but it is easy to get through, and you ought to get through this about 100 times before you start to understand what's in it. There's only one place in it that where religion is mentioned, and that's in the First Amendment, that Congress shall make no law regarding the establishment of religion. And that had a very specific meaning to our founders, and they were right about this too, and this is also true. The government itself should not found a sect of a church and force people to belong to it. You are free to believe whatever you want in this nation. 
You're free to be a, a Jew, a Muslim, a Christian, uh, an atheist, a rock worshiper. You're even free to worship Satan if you want to. But it is important to understand that the laws of this nation, the principles upon which it were, was founded, were Christian principles. In other words, we operate under a moral law. It is an objective moral law. In other words, it is the truth. It isn't what's okay for you is, okay, is not okay for someone else. It isn't that you get to create your own right and your own wrong on a daily basis. What is right is right for everybody. It is right today and is right forever. The things that are wrong are wrong today. They're wrong for everyone and they're wrong forever. That's the difference between right and wrong. Relative morality is a lie. It's a lie perpetrated by the government. It's a lie perpetrated by the socialists. It's a lie perpetrated by the Communist Party. It's a lie perpetrated by Satan himself. To try to get you to think that you can create your own God, your own rules, and your own right, your own wrong, and what's okay for you, I'm okay, you're okay, it's okay. As long as you think it's okay, it's got to be okay. That's not the truth. Some things are right and some things are wrong. And that's the principle that this country was founded on. And in fact, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will stand here and proclaim that all day. Anyone that doesn't like it, the door is open. You're free to leave. But it has nothing to do with what I believe. It has to do with the principles upon what this nation was founded. Algernon Sidney, on December the 7th in 1683, had his head chopped off for what he believed about liberty and the righteousness of liberty. And what he said was, swords were given to men that none might be slaves. Swords were given to men that none might be slaves except those who don't know how to use them. That's an interesting principle, and that also is part of the founding of this nation in the Second Amendment. This nation was founded upon these principles, that God Almighty is the author and the creator of the universe, that all men were created in his image, and being created in his image, you enjoy certain liberties and freedom that God himself enjoyed. If you were created in the image of a donkey, you would not have those liberties, but you weren't. You were created in God's image, and once again, this is a founding principle of this nation. It's in our founding document. Is the Constitution our founding document? No. It's our second try. The Articles of, of uh, uh, excuse me, the, um, I can't remember the name of it now, the Articles of Incorporation, or whatever they call them, uh, that, that was the first try. Constitution was a second try when that didn't work. We had 10 presidents of the United States before George Washington. They lasted about a year, a little less than a year each. Some years there were two of them. Um, and I can't remember the name of that document. I don't know why. I guess I'm getting old. But anyway, but in the Declaration of Independence, which is our founding document, it said that all men were created. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, no one has to show us these things. They were written in our hearts at the moment of our creation. These truths are self-evident. What's the evidence of the creator? The creation itself. To have a creation, you have to have a creator. To have a book, you have to have an author. It's simple. So we hold certain truths to be self-evident. No one explains these to us. No one teaches them to us. We just know these things. Unless you deny the truth. That all men were created equal that we were endowed by our Creator. We didn't buy these things. We didn't purchase them. They were just part of us. They were made part of us when we were created. We were endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights, above those like liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And here's the important part of that. Whether you believe this or not personally, this is the founding of our nation, period. That to secure these rights, governments were instituted among men. It does not say that to build roads, governments were instituted among men. It does not say that to make sure you have social security, governments were instituted among men. It doesn't say any of that stuff. All of that came later, and it was a corruption of the original idea. That you have Medicare, governments were instituted among men. No. Government has one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to secure the right of the governed deriving all, all of its just powers by the consent of the governed. And that means representation. 
Thomas Paine said that the first legislature will be held under the branches of a big oak tree. Everybody shows up and you argue about what you want. And whoever has the best argument, that's the way things are going to go. But he also said in a pamphlet, oddly enough, called Common Sense, very little of that today in government, he said that as the colonies grow, representation must also grow. So that all parts of the colony, it didn't say one man, one vote, it didn't say everybody has an equal share in the argument, it said all parts of the colony would be adequately represented. That means that rural communities deserve representation too. What an odd concept. It is against the founding principles and the principles of, of the Lord God Almighty that two cities in California tell everybody how they're going to live. That is not our founding principle. That is a corruption by the Warren Court later. So Thomas Paine said again that representation must grow as the colonies grow so that all parts of the colony are equally represented and, and this is more important, and so that those elected will never be so far removed from the people that they are able to form a separate agenda from those who elect them. How do you figure one for a million in state senate in California works? Do you feel represented? Does your community feel represented? What about one for half a million in the assembly? Do you really feel like the guy has your best interest or your community or your neighborhood or your neighborhood watch or your sheriff's department or anything for that matter? Is that really the nearest thing to his heart or could it be the money to get reelected? Because these guys are making millions and they're making it off of you. So those are our founding principles. That, that's just the truth and, and people like it or they don't like it but it's still true. A revolution was fought over number two, right? That all men were created equal because the king said that English, English subjects in England were created a little more equal than, you, than people in the colonies were. Do you know how he did that? He did that with the coercive acts and the intolerable acts. He did that by placing a tax on everything, every piece of paper that passed through the colonies. And do you know what the colonists, colonists did? They revolted. They didn't revolt with guns at that time. What they did was they created alternative sources of publishing that did not use paper that was regulated by the king. The coercive acts in Boston were over 348 crates of tea. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a shooting war that caused the, the most free, powerful nation on earth, the only constitutional republic to ever survive, was created over 348 crates of tea tossed into Boston Harbor. Because after that, the king created the coercive acts where he decided that he was going to punish you and punish your neighbors and cause you to behave more correctly. Carve, I, I mean the coercive acts, were things that were created out of falsehood and created out of lies that the government knew were lies. Carve was created out of lies by Dr. Hiram Tran. Everybody knew they were lies. Tran went to jail for it later. He was at least charged with a crime. I don't know if he ever did any time. But even in spite of that, in spite of the head of California EPA knowing that CARB was a lie, the law was created and thousands of people were put out of business for that lie. And, I, and I'm just asking you, just uh, this is a rhetorical question, but you can shout something out if you really feel compelled to. What did we do about that? You guys are already pretty well educated, I gotta say. We did absolutely nothing. We allowed our friends and our neighbors to be driven out of business and driven out of the place, and oftentimes they were born with their families and driven into states that they didn't know with people they didn't know and didn't care about to try to start their lives over again, and we did nothing. Do you know what happened in Nazi Germany when they did nothing? About 11 million people died, some say more. The Constitution was not meant to protect us from changing times. The Constitution was not meant to protect us from changing technology. It wasn't. Times and technology were changing so rapidly during the Revolutionary War when the Constitution was written, it was unbelievable. There was money and power being played out on a scale we wouldn't even recognize today. Countries were almost at war with one another. Navies were moving, armies were moving, 
millions of dollars which would be tens of billions today were being spent on this the founding fathers knew about changing times they were entering the industrial revolution they were inventing things that couldn't have even been imagined 20 years before then no the constitution was meant to protect us from one thing and one thing only and that's human nature because human nature never changes and the god that created us and the god that gave us the wisdom to create this constitution knew those things in fact daniel webster said hold on to the constitution with all your strength my friends because miracles do not tend to cluster and what's happened once in 6,000 years is unlikely to happen again, and he was right. You can't give away your liberty. You can't, you can't sell it. No one can take it from you. Abraham Lincoln said that no army, no matter how powerful from Asia or Europe, would ever be capable of taking one drink from the Mississippi River. He said, no, if we fall, it will be by our own hand and from within. No one can take your liberty. God gave it to you. He wouldn't allow anyone to take it. But he does respect free will. If you want to give it away, he'll let you. And that's exactly what we collectively, and by the way, I include myself in this, have done. In fact, that's why I'm standing here today. Because with the, the grace and good wishes of my wife and my partner, I'm allowed to do these things at the sacrifice of our family, our money, our business, her, her life. I mean, I don't have time really to spend with my family like I should because this is important to me and it's a, it should become important to all of us before what little we have left is, is literally gone. The state that we live in is a fallen state. It is a failed state. The state of California is over one and a half trillion dollars in debt. In fact, OpenTheBooks.org is doing a, a forensic audit on all 50 states. Only one of them refuses to open the books. It ain't South Dakota. <laughs> it's California. And you know what? You know what the treasurer of, of California said? Well, I just don't have access to all the bills that we pay. <laughs> they, the state of California said, "Well, it's it's." It, it's not as though we have a checkbook. The state of California says you can't have access to those records. I've done FOIAs with the state of California myself, and they, and you know what, some of them come back and they say, well, we just don't have access to that information. Well, I'm asking myself, well, you don't, who does? And if you don't have access to it, why am I being persecuted over it? If this information doesn't exist, why do I find myself in this kind of trouble? Um, Woody gave you a little resume. I'll just give you a real quick one because one part of it's important. Um, I am also a Christian, a husband, a father. I was a peace officer, and I was asked to take indefinite leave of absence from my job because someone at the county, someone in county administration, complained about the speeches I give in front of groups like you. Someone at the county complained because I stand for the Second Amendment, I stand for the Bill of Rights, and I stand for my Lord and Savior before I will stand up for government. And I have to tell you, I love that job. I got to chase dopers and raid marijuana gardens. It was fun, and I thought I was doing some good, but apparently it wasn't, that wasn't important to them. What was important to them was how you line up politically. That was more important than whether you, you hold your oath of office, you hold your honor and your integrity before all things. And so because I hold my honor in much higher esteem than I do any job, I left. And my indefinite leave of absence was pretty short because I resigned. I can't work in a department that doesn't respect the things that built this country. I can't work for an elected official that doesn't have enough backbone to stand for the people who are trying to do the right thing that work for him, or stand for the people that elected him. <laughs> Part of the Second Amendment problems we get into here in California is you don't have one. So I sued the government over that. That really made him mad. 
I mean, they were mad at me before, but they were really mad when I advocated in court that you should have the right to the open carry of a loaded weapon anywhere you see fit in the state of California. And someone asked me, well, would you trust your neighbor with a tank? And I said, yeah, I would. As a matter of fact, I don't want a tank because I don't want to have to work on it or I don't have enough grease guns for it. But if my neighbor had a tank, he's a good guy and I know where I'd go hide if things got bad. I mean, I trust you with weapons. I do. You're lawful citizens of the state of California. When we went into court on that lawsuit, you know what the judge said? Well, really, what is a lawful citizen? And I'll shorten the story up. My attorney basically said, well, you know, Your Honor, someone that's not a criminal. Yeah, and that's what courts do. But quite frankly, Gavin Newsom and his mafia, because that's what they are, Gavin Newsom is a federal felon. He's in violation of Title VIII, Section 1324, harboring and shielding an illegal alien. He's in violation of his oath of office, Article 20 of the California Constitution, because he is in disobedience of Article III, Section 1 of the California Constitution, which says California is an inseparable part of the Union and the United States Constitution is the highest law of the land. Well, Gavin Newsom is denying you your First Amendment right. He's denying you your Second Amendment right. He'd like to deny you your Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment rights. And he's in the process of doing that as well. You know there's a mayor in Champaign, Illinois, that just gave her city employees the power to seize private property and take title to the same. Seize it. A little violation of the Constitution there. Nobody said a word. Very well, you know. Well, look, we have to stop the coronavirus. Will seizing your home stop the coronavirus? Kind of doubt it. It started in Wuhan, China. It came over on an airplane or the gum on the bottom of somebody's shoe. It's spreading in places. Some places it isn't spreading. It's about the same as the flu so far. But really, would stopping the sale of guns and ammunition in Champaign, Illinois, stop coronavirus? It has nothing to do with it. This is a power grab, pure and simple, and it's the same thing that Gavin Newsom and his mafia does every single day to me, you, and everybody in this state. He has rejected faith in God. He has rejected moral standard, and he wants to replace it with relative morality where government decides what is right and what is wrong, and government preaches that to your children, and by the time your children grow up, they are good little soldiers in California's mafia. That's the fight we're in. The educational fight is one of the biggest fights we're in because what good does it do if us gray hairs toe the line and some of you older brown hairs toe the line, but your children are indoctrinated at some point? We'll just be outnumbered with progressives and communists, and then they'll win anyway. And believe me, the Chinese have the long view of this. The communists have the long view. They take the 100-year view. We take the one-year view. Can we succeed today or tomorrow or next year? But the forces of evil take the long view of this. And believe me, I have been all over the world. I've been involved in six wars for the United States government as a serviceman, as a contractor, and a couple other things. And I want you to understand that evil is most assuredly real, and it is here. And if you allow it into your life or into your government or into your home or into your school, you will be consumed by it. I mean, can you imagine that people are willing to beat each other up over toilet paper? Yeah, I laughed at that too. But you know what's not funny about that? If they're willing to beat each other up over toilet paper, what would they be willing to do over food or fuel or shelter or warmth or transportation? I mean, the storm is coming. I'm not saying it's here today. I don't know if it'll be here a thousand years from now because the Bible says no man should, will know that. Only the Father knows that. But it doesn't mean we're not supposed to see that something is going wrong. I believe that uh, the early Americans, the founders, called that an evil and pernicious design. And when a long train of abuses, also from the uh, Declaration of Independence, and when a long train of abuses becomes apparent, you know, the first time the government makes an evil mistake, you can kind of say, well, that's probably just a mistake. The second time you can say, well, they just made another one. But what about the 34th time? What about when you can't fish in the river? What about when you can't irrigate? What about when you can't buy ammunition 
unless you have a gun of that caliber registered with the state because you'll fail the background check trying to buy ammunition for a gun that, according to the state, you don't even own. What about that? Is that a mistake? That seems like a pretty complex mistake to me. What about Penal Code Section 28550 that says you may not carry a loaded weapon exposed in the state of California? What about the reason that that was brought about? Because 28 Black Panthers had a demonstration in Sacramento in 1967, and a Republican governor, Ronald Reagan, and a Republican congressman got mad. And they decided to prove a point to the Black Panthers by taking your right to carry away from you. And that's exactly what they did. And then what about, is this a mistake, when little Anthony Portantino in 2012 and 2013 made this categorical statement about all the people of California, people he didn't even know. You don't need a gun to go buy a cheeseburger. That's what he said. And he said that he passed a law with his Democratic buddies that you will not carry an unloaded weapon exposed in the state of California, either a long gun or a short gun, handgun. You lost your Second Amendment, and I remember this. No one said a word. Not the NRA, not anyone. None of us. And some of you that are my age and even a little bit younger, you were there. I remember we used to carry unloaded all the time. My dad used to do it. My dad used to carry loaded. He'd just drop his gun on the seat, and we'd go wherever we were going. And he'd put his gun in his holster. No one said a word about that. Nobody cared. The gutter was not running red with blood because my dad was carrying his snub nose 38 with him into the grocery store. No one even looked at it. We used to carry openly all the time, unloaded, after Anthony got done with us. No one cared. It wasn't as though people were afraid. Crime didn't go up. Crime didn't go down. Crime didn't do anything. But when we lost that right, there was nothing done about it. Nothing at all. You know, the Bible tells us that narrow is the path that leads to salvation, and few will find it. And the reason for that is, it isn't enough to say, I believe. That isn't enough. You also have to have some action. And I'm not talking about being a good person, because nobody can do that. What I'm talking about is changing your ways. Broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many will find it. Why? Because you don't have to do anything. All you got to do is just be yourself. Well, that's all right. I'm too busy to go to church. I'm too busy to go to that meeting. I'm too busy to go to that speech. I'm too busy to show up at the school board and tell the school board in no uncertain terms that my four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old does not need to know the joys of a transgender lifestyle. Yeah. You know, I mean, the game's on tonight. We're having chicken. I, I really... You know, it's Monday night football. I re do I really have to go to the school board to talk about that? Do I really want to go to the school board to insist that my 14-year-old daughter will not be allowed to get an abortion and murder an unborn child without my knowledge and permission? I, I just don't have time. I'm sorry. I got stuff to do. I got to mow the lawn tomorrow. I need my sleep. I need to have seconds for dinner. Uh, I'm going to swear a little bit here, folks. What the hell is the matter with us? What are we thinking? We live in a state where the governor and his mafia declared in public that this will be the abortion vacation destination for the entire world. He actually said that. Is it a sin for us to pay taxes to a government that then uses the money to murder unborn children? Is that a sin? Yeah. Amen. Amen it is. What can we do about it? Can you stop paying your taxes? You know, probably not, but there's a lot of other things we can do. There's a lot of other things we can do, and we need to start doing them, and Woody's right. Call to action is a good idea, because I'll tell you what, if we could show up one time with 100,000 people in Sacramento and do business and be organized and communicate and act as a unit, we would win something. They could not stop us. If we just showed up in Sacramento with 150,000 people in broom handles and told the people in that building, you're not coming out until you recognize our right to be adequately represented according to our beliefs and according to our morals. 
and according to the laws and standards of the constitution of the united states you will stay in that building until you change the way you behave toward us and behave toward our communities we would win something but when we keep showing up with the same hundred people it's just not enough it's too it's too little and it's too late now the courts are another issue that we have and the courts are another problem that we have and courts deny rights to people every single day uh, we have a lawsuit against the state of California for Second Amendment, and the state of Jefferson has a lawsuit against the state of California for lack of representation and dilution of oath. You know what the court says to us in, in the representation case? They're saying, in essence, the people of the state of California do not have the right to be in front of court and ask for a change in representation. That's what the court said to us. You lack the Article Three standing, in other words, you don't belong in court asking for change. Okay, so we had a big campaign where we asked the legislature for change. 23 counties signed resolutions that they want to withdraw from California. We had a phone call, we had an email campaign where hundreds of thousands of emails, tens of thousands of phone calls, thousands of personal visits, and not one single legislator wanted to know what we wanted or why we wanted it. They just said, get out. One senator said, I don't have face-to-face -face meetings with my constituents. How arrogant the mafia has become. So we were turned down in court. We're still fighting that out. We're expecting a decision from the Ninth Circus any minute. Um, we've been rejected by the legislature. We set up a meeting with the governor, and the governor sent a CHP officer. I actually felt sorry for this guy. He was embarrassed. He sent a CHP officer out and said, I'm sorry, the governor, and we had an appointment. We were going to give the governor a handful of papers and tell him what we wanted and why we wanted it. We weren't expecting an answer. We just wanted to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the person who says he's the commander-in-chief of the state. He sent a CHP officer out there, knowing we had an appointed time and place to be, and we were there, to say, I'm sorry, the governor can't see you today. And this is a quote, by the way. He's busy doing important stuff. That's a quote. Can you imagine that? Okay, so we've been through the legislature, we've been through the judicial, we've been to the executive. That's all three branches. Now what? Now what do we do? When there's a contract, and Constitution is nothing more than a contract, that's all it is, between an entity that is created by the people and the people themselves, when the entity breaches that contract, the contract is no longer valid and the people are free to seek self-help. If you purchased an automobile and you had an agreement with some car dealer and the car dealer breached the agreement, in other words, you have a warranty, but the car dealer refused to honor the warranty, that's a breach of contract. Well, if the contract isn't valid for one side, then it's not valid for either side. And all parties are free to seek what legal term self-help. So we are now, in my opinion, free to seek self-help. What, under what form does that self-help come? That's what we need to decide with groups like uh, Call to Action. That's what we need to decide with tea parties. That's what we need to decide with Neighborhood Watch and, and the State of Jefferson. We need to decide what form self-help will take. I don't advocate violence. I think it's, uh, it's a mistake. I think we're a long way from there but I do advocate the power of numbers. I do advocate intervention in local political affairs. I do advocate organization of people. I advocate showing up. I advocate making the Board of Education honor the Constitution and the educational morals that you hold dear and you hold to be true. I advocate showing up in numbers. I advocate community gatherings this size at the local school board. Would they ignore you if you showed up with 300 people at your local school board? Absolutely not. You've got to start doing these things. We've got to start doing these things, or we're going to lose. Now, this isn't new. Human nature is flawed. It's always been flawed. You can look at the Bible, and in Ecclesiastes, written thousands of years ago, it says, that which has been is, it doesn't say may, it says, is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything that we can
can say regarding human nature, oh look, this is new. Oh, that's a new way to lie. Oh, that's a new way to cheat. Oh, that's a new way to steal. No, it's always the same. It's always been the same. And it will be the same. No amount of law will change that. And when government takes the place of God in your life, your life is going to change forever unless you do something about it. And that's where we're headed in this state. Because Thomas Gordon said, wherever there's liberty, there's usually a plot against it. Because people who do evil hate the light. They love their sin. They love the darkness. And light cannot have fellowship with darkness. Where there's light, there can't be darkness. And where there's darkness, there isn't any light. That's the fight we're in, folks. I mean, this sounds mundane. It's not. It's a fight for our lives. And I've seen it on six continents. I have seen people who have been deprived of their liberty fight and die for that liberty in whatever form they can regain it. We have the benefit here of supposedly being a nation of laws. Most countries don't have that. We have the benefit here of representative government, so to speak. Most countries don't have that. So what we have to do is we've got to work within the law and we've got to work within the system. But here's the rub. We also have to be prepared to stand. And that's what the Second Amendment is for. It tells the government that there is only so far they can go, that there is a line in the sand. And Colonel Travis started that phrase. He drew a line in the sand, and he didn't say, don't cross this. He said, who will cross this line? And he knew that 48 hours later, every one of them would be dead. And every man, save one, crossed that line, knowing that he did so at the cost of his own life, in order to gain time for Sam Houston to come with the army. That's the fight we're in. That's the character of the fight. That's the character of our enemy. They don't have any scruples. They don't have any morals. They don't care what they do, and they don't care what they say. And they don't care what happens to you. Because, as Woodrow Wilson put it, we need a class of elites to govern the people because you're basically too dumb to know what's best for your own life. And then we need a class of, of people who are prepared to serve. And that was over 100 years ago. I mean, how far are we willing to take this? Are we willing to stand? Lavoie Finnegan, who was killed by FBI and Oregon State Troopers in Oregon, and he was murdered, by the way, and I was a peace officer, so I know how you build a roadblock. I know that the only reason to build a roadblock on a, on a blind corner is, is so that you could get some trouble going. And those guys killed him and lied about it. The government lied about it. And then another branch of government, the judicial branch, covered for that lie. That's the world you live in now. And they do that in California each and every day. We fought fish and game for water for 20 years. We fought the state of California or a violation of the Constitution for as long as I've lived in Siskiyou County, a little over 30 years. And we have had some victories. That's the good news. I'm not a glass is half empty kind of guy. It might sound like, sound like it right now, but it's, it's not true. I believe that we can win these things by acting together, by meaning it, by standing for something. second, but I just want you to understand that, that liberty has a price. Yes, it was a gift. It was a gift placed in your heart in the moment of your creation by the God who made you, but it does have a price, and that price is paid by every single generation. Every generation pays that price, or they don't. If they don't pay the price, then the next generation has to pay double, and that's the situation we're in. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. But it's also a willingness to stand in the face of horrendous odds. It is a willingness to stand when there is no winning. It's a willingness to stand only to be able to say, I'm going to die free, knowing that the fight's going to be lost. And our history is replete with millions and millions of men and women who have done that throughout the history of the United States and throughout the history of the world. In 1940. One, 88 20 year olds stood on the deck of the carrier Hornet and they were about to take bombers that were never meant to, to take off from a carrier 
and fly to Japan and bomb Japan with no effect whatsoever. It wasn't going to stop anything. They weren't going to win any battle. They were doing it as a symbol. They'd been caught by a trawler. They knew they didn't have enough fuel to get back to the ship, and quite frankly, they probably doubted they could land on the ship even if they had the fuel. So they knew it was a one-way trip, and they knew it was for nothing, except to tell the Japanese Empire that we will stand, and we will not go quietly. And our liberty is not for sale, and it is not to be taken by anyone except at the peril of their lives and their blood. And our fathers and our forefathers swore an oath to one another. They pledged their sacred honor, they pledged their blood, their treasure, and their sacred honor to secure liberty for themselves and their posterity. That's the important part. What happens to me is irrelevant. It doesn't matter to me what happens to me. What happens to these children and their children and you young people, that's what matters to me. I've already fought my fight. I've already blown my opportunities or capitalized on them, one or the other. They're gone. But what happens to you matters. And what I'm asking you today is, will you stand for something? It's important and it matters. Yes. We've been under one form of tyranny for, or another in this state for 50 years. The fact that they call it soft martial law today doesn't mean anything to me. It's irrelevant. It's immaterial. The fight has always been the same fight. Liberty or death. That's the fight. Liberty or death. So we are the people. We're the only ones that can fix this. It's up to us. And as Patrick Henry said, I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death, because I would rather die free than live a slave. I would be happy to die. deny your liberty. We have the state painted into a corner. The judge knows that we've been deprived of the Second Amendment. I fully expect to have open carry in the state of California in all 58 counties uh, at when this suit settles. And it may go to the Supreme Court, but I don't think it'll have to. I think we're waiting on the New York Rifle and Pistol Association case because that has to do with a Fourth Amendment claim to travel within a state with lawfully owned property, a firearm and possessed for lawful purposes, and that's one of our, our claims. Our other claim is that in some counties, like Siskiyou County, you have the, you have a permission slip to carry concealed. I think you guys have it here in Taven County as well. But you have no right to, to carry. And that's been pointed out to the judge in the court. Um, and I think that in the end we'll prevail on that one. But it's going to be a fight, so please, when we need you, please show up. The Citizens for Fair Representation case, where we hope to start a pathway to the state of Jefferson. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals decided that they did not want to hear oral argument. Gosh, don't we have an amendment about public trial, something like that? Well, the court now is using coronavirus, and they're saying, we don't want to have public trials anymore. We're going to make our decisions in private and in secret with information that we have in the paperwork with no oral argument. Tyranny comes, and it comes in the night, and just like Satan, is a liar and a thief, and it approaches those that aren't aware and aren't awake, and it's never going to stop unless you stop it. So those two cases are progressing. We may make some hay out of that, and we may not. But I urge you, belong to a group. Join Woody's group, CTA, or not CTA, C2A, sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go sign up as soon as I get finished here. Stand for something, please. It's important. If you don't, you'll fall for anything. Thank you.
Um, we really appreciate you, Mark, all you do.